There we go. Well, welcome everybody. We are so excited to have you. Good afternoon or good morning if you're joining us from the West Coast. This is our fourth event in this Outcomes Estimation Tools training webinar series. And this time we're focusing on the NRCS Cover Crop Economics Tool. Thank you so much for being here. I'm Michelle Perez. I'm the Water Initiative Director for American Farmland Trust, and I'm joined by my two colleagues, Aisha Tap Ross and Kinsey Rice. For those of you who don't know, AFT is a national nonprofit organization founded in 1980, and our mission is threefold. First, to save the land that sustains us um, by protecting farmland, number one, two, promoting sound farming practices, and three, keeping farmers on the land and preparing for the next generation of farmers. So for today's webinar, after a few reminders and a quick poll to see who's in the room, we'll hear from Brian Kerwin of USDA NRCS about the cover crop economics tool. He'll first lead us in a presentation and then a demonstration of that tool. And we've reserved the last 15 minutes uh, for Q&A and discussion. We wanna thank our funders, EPA Office of Water and the Walton Family Foundation and our latest funder, the Mosaic Foundation for making this webinar series possible. I'll turn it over to Aisha for some housekeeping reminders now. Hi, uh, this is Aisha Tapp Ross. Um, we are using the Zoom webinar platform for this series. So that means that as attendees, you will have your camera and microphones turned off throughout the event. You can use uh, the Q&A feature at the bottom of the screen at any time to ask questions, and the speakers will answer the questions during the last 15 minutes of this event. You can use your name or be anonymous when asking questions or making comments. You can also vote up questions you want to be prioritized. If you're having any technical difficulties, you can direct message Kinsey and she will try to help you out. Following each webinar, you will receive an email uh, within three to four days that will provide the recording and the slides for the presentations, as well as information about the next month's speaker. And by the following Monday, we will post the recordings to the webinar registration page, uh, which we absolutely welcome you to share with colleagues and friends that may be interested in uh, viewing. Uh, Kinsey uh, will post the link to the uh, FIC Outcomes Estimation Tools Training Webinar Series page. Um, and you will, uh, you will, uh, which will be an evaluation survey um, in the, uh, which she'll, she'll post in the chat box, sorry. Uh, next page, please. Sorry. Great, yeah, so just to follow up. So, you know, Thank at you. the end of this, um, we've got a six question. Honestly, it takes two minutes to complete evaluation survey and it'll pop up right away when you close the um, webinar and you know, you'll know you find it in the chat. So it really helps us out to, to uh, find out what you think of these each event and helps us plan uh, for the next events. So here is the three questions we'd like to ask to find out who Thank is you. here today with us. Uh, yes, and uh, Michelle, um, my... <laughs> my PowerPoint restarted. So um, would you be able to read those for me, please? <laughs> Absolutely. So um, uh, whoever launches the polls, please do. And I can read the questions out. There they are. Which one uh, sector best reflects your occupation? Are you from a government agency, a nonprofit, non-government, uh, an academic institution, or a corporation or environmental markets developer, or would you like to choose other? Number two, if there are only four types of audience members, which one best describes you? Are you a developer of outcomes estimation tools, methods, or models, a current user of these, these things, a potential future user, or a person interested in learning about outcomes estimation tools and issues? And third, what is your experience level with this particular tool, the NRCS Cover Crops Economics Tool? Had not heard of it, heard of it, but never used it heard of it and used it, and I refer to it often. Please take the time to tell us who you are, who's in the room, and uh, within a few more seconds, we'll close the poll and share the results. I'll let 
Kinsey decide when to close the poll. It looks like a couple people are still taking it and we'll just give them about 30 more seconds to finish up and I'll end it. Thank you. All right, the results should be on your screen too. Looks like uh, we are mostly representatives from government agencies, nearly 50%, followed then by a third of us who are NGOs, farm trade associations, environmental groups, et cetera. Um, just over 10% in the academic arena, 8% in the corporation or environmental markets developers. Welcome to you. Um, the, we're always eager to have new folks in the room and other. Then um, let's see, about a third, a third, and a third are current users of outcomes estimation tools, methods, or models, potential future users, and persons interested in uh, learning about. Awesome. You've come to the right place, I hope. Um, you, uh, most of you have heard of um, the NRCS cover crop economics tool, um, but never used it. So I hope uh, you take a take a look and reconsider that today. This was great. I'm so glad we did this. I love learning about who you are. I hope you don't mind. It takes a little time, but I think it's worth it. All right, what do we have next? Let's see, put the cursor in the right place. Final slide. Uh, just a reminder, you know, uh, we have this website um, that tells you what's been happening, what's coming up next, and provides you with the link to the recording. If you miss something or you want to go back, you can listen and watch the recording, and you can also get the resources, the PDFs of the slides if you don't like to listen. So here we are, uh, August 2, we're doing the NRCS Cover Crop Economics Tool, and next time in September, we'll see you for the Field Print Platform, which is a climate and water quality outcomes estimation tool. And then just FYI, no changes to your calendar necessary. We have switched up the October 4 event. We're now going to feature the EPA's pollution load estimator tool or a PLET tool for water quality. And in December, we switched it out with AFT's own retrospective soil health economic calculator tool. Um, so we're looking forward to everyone uh, joining for, for both of those events. All right, and I'm turning it over to our featured speaker, Mr. Brian Kerwin. Brian, I'll let you share your screen now. All right, we're working on it here as we're speaking. And so hopefully now that you can see. Yes, thank you. It's showing. Well, and thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you very much to American Farmland Trust for the invitation to be able to visit with you all today. I'm Brian Kerwin, and we're going to be talking about our Natural Resources Conservation Service Cover Crop Economics Tool. This is part of the American Farmland Trust Outcomes Estimation Tool webinar series. And as Michelle noted earlier, this is the fourth event on their calendar and they have several excellent educational offerings coming forward and I hope you have the opportunity to listen in on them. A little bit about myself, just so that you have some idea who's talking to you today. Um, my official title is I'm the Central National Agricultural Economist. My headquarters office is in Fort Worth, Texas. Um, I did grow up in central Illinois, a um, little farm town called Isdale, about 30 miles from the University of Illinois, um, that was working in Illinois as the state economist for Natural Resources Conservation Service when we began working on this tool that I've been married to my wife, Cindy, for 40 years. Um, you see a picture of us both there uh, at the end of Alaska Highway, and we look like we're dressed kind of funny. Well, we decided it would be a whole lot of fun to jump on the motorcycle and ride from central Illinois to Alaska. I mean, who wouldn't want to do that, right? Um, but know that uh, the biking is uh, something my wife and I both enjoy doing very much. Um, that, And additionally, with my uh, technical and educational background, also try and bring a practical application to much of the work that I do. Um, active fourth generation farmer, my great grandfather uh, settled the, the home farm, which we're still honored to be able to farm a little bit of when he immigrated here from Ireland. And so not with me today, but I must include in the introduction is my dear friend, 
and co-worker Lauren Cartwright. Lauren was the state economist in Missouri at the time we began working on this cover crop tool. And we were trying to help answer questions that were being asked of us by clientele. Lauren provided a lot of great insights. Our backgrounds were very complementary to each other. Lauren had very much of an environmental sciences background and a lot of programming experience in addition to her economics experience. And I had part of that production background in addition to some of the other academic pursuits that I'd been involved with. And we ended up making a really good team. I can tell you one of the great things about working with Lauren and her program is that she makes it all look so easy. I'd be sitting there trying to write out my formulas and some of them were getting pretty complex, two and three sets of parentheses. And I, I write them out before I try and type them in and Lauren looks at it and laughs and said, here, give me that for a second. And she types away and does magic with macros and all my uh, real complicated formulas got very easy. But without Lauren, without her insights and without her input, there would not be a cover crop tool. And so I feel compelled to introduce her just as if she was here presenting with me. Lauren has since been promoted. She works on a national policy team working uh, on issues here for the agency now at a national level. One thing I would uh, like to note, and we all should be able to laugh at ourselves here just a little bit, um, we try not to take ourselves too seriously. You know, we like to have the uh, the running idea that the views of the in our CS economists are presented for entertainment purposes only. Um, that with this tool that I'm about to demonstrate with you today, I would like to re-emphasize that it is a tool that we encourage people to do multiple runs, multiple what ifs. Don't run just a single analysis and say, "Aha, there it is." When we built this tool and with each of the subsequent updates and edits that we've done to it, we have tried to use the very best scientific information and published materials background that we could find. But with all of that said, being built on the best science, it is still just a tool and it's going to respond to the inputs that have been provided. This slide and the next slide are a couple that uh, American Farmland Trust have asked us to specifically include in our presentations. And this is to be able to provide all of you kind of a touchstone and a way to be able to go back and look at some of these different tools, see how they compare to each other, trying to make some of the comparisons between what are the tools made for, what are they not made for, how will they work, and making those comparisons easier as you try and find the tools that best fit your, your individual situation. You know, and just to talk about this tool for a little bit, you know, when we're talking about that scale and level of specificity. This tool was built and designed for use at the farm level. It is built and designed for individuals to be able to look at what are they doing in their current operation? What are the crops that they're raising? What is that crop rotation that they're using and things like that? And be able to see what the effect is there. Um, it is not geospecific. It is be able to be used across the United States here that when we're looking at what are the outcomes that you get after you take the time to utilize this tool and go through some of the data runs. What we are going to have as output are going to be economic and financial evaluations of adding some of these specific cover crops to your different crop rotation. These are going to be items that we can measure and monetize, you know, where we can directly calculate that, that dollar value. And we're going to express those outputs in terms of dollars per acre. That as far as conservation practices, you know, that cover crops themselves are only differentiated by their different types in and of themselves, or the cost of the seed, how is it planted, how is it terminated, and things like that. You can also look at how cover crops can affect other parts of your operation. Do they have an effect on tillage management, nutrient management, 
selection of herbicides and things like that. All these are different variables that can be looked at, considered, and taken into account in part of this analysis. It is an effective tool to be able to use on cropland and grazing land, and it is was built on primarily the first beta tests that we did with it was in commodity production, both row crop and small grains. We've ad added livestock to that, and we've also beta tested it and used it as applicability in vegetable crops. We've tested it in areas like Florida, California, and things like that to see if, how the effects are there, and we've not had any adverse feedback in terms of being able to utilize them. As far as where, and we were talking about this just a moment ago when I said it's not geographically specific, it, all of our testing was only done in the continental United States. We extensively beta tested it uh, several different times, both inside the USDA and outside with universities, other academics, and also some private individuals trying to test for rigor, trying to test for replicability of, of some of the data sets. We were also looking at, does it give answers that are relative to what they were seeing on the ground? And we, we felt very good about the background and testing that we did on that to, to be able to make that statement. We have just recently started beta testing for Alaska, Hawaii, and the, uh, the Pacific Island areas. And so I cannot comment to that currently. As far as the time and the skills and the things like that, the, the biggest item that you're going to need is a little bit of knowledge about your own operation. You know, what are some of the common costs of production that you have? You know, do you know that your herbicide costs is $30 an acre? If you don't, it, it may take you a little bit of time looking through some records and things like that to come up with some of this background information. Same with seed costs and things like that. Once you have some of this background information together, the tool becomes much easier and faster, and you can have multiple data runs in 30 minutes or less, including taking the time to print out a given data run, excuse me, once you have that data together. When we want to discuss things like strengths and limitations and, and trade-offs, and is this the right tool for you? You know, we want to start with our strengths. We like to talk about being able to answer what if scenarios. And you can look at this and it becomes very easy to change and we'll have a demonstration later. And I will try and show just how quickly we can make some of those changes. But we like to be able to ask the question, what if? What if the price of the cover crop seed goes up? What if the price of the cover crop seed goes down? What if certain benefits increase? What if they don't? that being able to look at these different variables, their impact, in, in essence, a type of a sensitivity analysis, how much does changing this one variable change the outputs that I'm expecting? We see this as a real strength of the tool. It can also be used within a county or watershed area, again, trying to look at where you have very similar crops and cropping patterns, and be able to look at it on a larger scale to look at some of those what ifs with some questions, how the adaptation may occur, and may be able to help convince people to adopt or at least to try something. But the tool is designed primarily for use at the individual level. Um, it's very user friendly. Um, talk about we people being able to sit there in their easy chair with their laptop and pulling up the, the download in Excel that we have and being able to do some of these different data runs. You don't have to have a, a big disk and lots of high powered computing capacity to be able to do this. It has been used by many different individuals. It's been used by universities. It's been used by other uh, governmental and non-governmental organizations. It has had very good acceptance. And um, I still remember when we were, Lauren and I were invited to uh, Washington DC as part of the uh, soil health renaissance and made a presentation regarding the tool there. Um, and I mentioned earlier about the applicability. Um, as far as the limitations of the tool, you know, as much as we might like to think so, not everything can be 100% rosy, not everything's a, always positive. There are some trade-offs. 
that the tool is not designed and would not do a very good job of trying to provide, you know, that county level, that area level, even watershed level evaluations. Um, that the tool only focuses on those benefits and costs that accrue directly to the producer or landowner. Um, those things that we can sit there and measure and monetize. Again, that's, that's something you will hear me emphasize different times in regards to the tool. We don't look at some of the positive and negative externalities that can come out of some of the different farming systems with or without the addition of cover crops. And I consider it a limitation, but not so, one so huge that it can't be overcome in terms of the data intensity. I mentioned earlier the imp importance of knowing some of the very common production costs that you may experience in your operation, things like seed costs, the cost of, of the cover crop, the cost of certain tillage passes or things like that, that is part of those variables for the costs and benefits that we'll discuss a little bit later. We're going to need some of that data. Again, the tool is only going to be as good as the data that is within it. Um, early on, before I start talking about the tool background, I would like to reemphasize Michelle's note earlier about at the end of this, you're going to have the opportunity to fill out a survey. Those surveys are really important and they are read. We read and value your responses, and especially when you can offer opportunities for providing improvement. Also, just as a side note, one of the questions that came out of those surveys, someone was asked, would we be addressing the difference in time frames when we talked about cover crops in this tool? And so if you were the individual and you're in the audience today, yes, we're going to try and address what some of those different time differentials are, talking about those short-term results versus the long-term results and things like that. And so just want you to know that your input is highly valued and we encourage you to fill out those surveys. A little bit about the tool itself, and you know, you see a little insert on the side, a part of a screenshot that actually comes from the tool itself. Um, Lauren and I began working on this in 2012, and we we're working back and forth and through all of the initial efforts. We had our first release of the uh, cover crop economic tool in 2014. We have since done there's been two subsequent updates. The first one came relatively quickly after its release. It was about eight months later, we had an initial update. And then the second one was about three years after that. The, the current version, if you find it online, is version 3.1. And so that because nothing ever dies on the internet, and even though you might think you've got all the old versions deleted, I know that there's still some 2.1 versions floating around out there. So make sure it's, you're on the, the current version if you do find it and open it up. Again, I would like to note that we relied on the best science and published literature that we could find with for this, that there are in the tool when you download it, there are numerous tabs. There's a um, literature and citations tab that we don't have every publication or every article that we referenced for use in the tool listed there, but we have a number of the primary and major references that we used in the development of this tool. We look at both the short run and the long run effects on the tool. The short run, we look at what is based on what is the rotation. If it's a one crop rotation, it's an annual. If it's a two crop rotation, we look at what is the average of those two years work together. If it's a four crop rotation, again, it does it based on those four years results is the short run. And then we have a long run where we can evaluate up to 50 years. And so we try to capture both those short-term and long-term concerns within that. The tool itself has been fairly widely utilized has been related back to us. It is our agency's cover crop economic tool. 
that used it extensively internally and for work that we have done within the agency. I know in working with uh, several land grant universities, I've got three of them listed here, University of Illinois, Iowa State, and the University of Minnesota, specifically because I worked with them directly on different projects regarding this tool. I know that there have been others. I had a uh, clip of a slide set sent to me that was being used at a University of Tennessee project, and they pointed out one of that they thought we were kind of conservative in some of our values and such in there. And to that extent that yes, we were, if, if there is a bias to our tool is that we were trying to be conservative in, in terms of value, in terms of time. But again, that is based also on what the literature was telling us at the time. Um, we're very humbled. And in, at the same time, I must admit very gratifying to know that others have used this as a foundation or basis for some other tools. Uh, significant hat tip to American Farmland Trust for being able to pick up what the basis of our tool was and be able to expand that with both their PSHEC and RSHEC tools. That I know that the University of Illinois has moved on and developed a cover crop tool of their own. And so that the, the initial introduction of this tool has led to greater growth and study within this given area. As far as presentations, um, I know that just for myself, I've not been able to keep track of them all. And I know from time to time that we are cited because I will get a, a note or a link that says, you know, that our work was cited in this given publication, but I have no way to track how many of them are there. Once Lauren and I completed this tool and released it, it moves into the public domain. We're very, very honored to have people want to be able to use it and utilize it. Um, want to give a little bit of an overview of the tool. Again, right here is what you're looking at. This is just a, a quick screenshot of what you will see when you open up the tool and what, what you're looking at on there. You know, that as I mentioned earlier, this tool is based on and built in an Excel platform. We made this tool intentionally, trying to make it user friendly. We chose to move forward in a partial budgeting analysis framework not trying to do enterprise budgets, not trying to keep track of everything on there. We want to know what changes and the easiest way to be able to track that and see what the effect of what is that change is by utilizing that partial budget framework. Um, it is very flexible again in that that user input is based on what your operation is. If your costs are really $12 an acre, when the county average might be $20 an acre, then you use your data. We're looking at both profitability and, and affordability. What is that difference between the economic and financial analysis? And again, what is the sensitivity? What happens though when you change one of those variables that what if? That accruing those benefits to the producer or own, landowner and again, focusing on those benefits that can be easily measured and monetized. Time frame matters in this, and had alluded to earlier that when we're talking about those short run results, and it's it's not uncommon at all to see negative short run results because some of the benefits from cover crops that accrue may take time. And we see some of that expressed in some of the research too. And it much of it depends on where you're at within the continental United States, soil types and things like that. But to generalize it just a little bit, what takes five years in Auburn, Alabama, might take 10 to 15 years in Columbia, Missouri, and might take 20 to 25 years in Minnesota. So time frame matters, location matters, then are we looking at something in the short term or the long term? Time frame matters a lot. Also, when producers look at what is the planning horizon of that land? Is this an owned farm? Is it a rented farm? With rented farms, oftentimes that planning horizon is much, much shorter and that time frame impact 
and those direct costs become much more important. And so again, time frame matters and we do try and address that within the tool. What the tool is not, you know, we everything has trade-offs and limitations and I brought it up earlier. We don't focus on what some of those different externalities are. We don't try to measure or monetize some of the changes in soil health. We know that there are many benefits to different cover crops. The difficulty with some of those benefits comes in how are they are measured? How long does it take to be able to see the change from that measure? And how do we value that change? With the lack of a ready market and transparent measurement source for many of those changes, we felt that the best thing to do was recognize that some of these exist, but not try and make them a part of the tool because we're trying to measure what are those immediate dollar changes that the individual is going to be look at. Within the tool, we do not consider agricultural policy, agency policy, anyone's policy, nor do we consider taxes or other outputs. And lastly, as you move into the arid west, where's general caution in the discussion and promotion of cover crops because of soil moisture concerns. I know there's been some experiments that there's been some individuals that have tried to use them in that environment. And there's been others that have had problems with the subsequent cash crop because of soil moisture shortages. And it was utilized by the cover crop. And so strong, strong caution when we're looking at this in the West. Would also like to give a, a thank you to Paul Mitchell at the University of Wisconsin. Between uh, versions one and two, Lauren and I discovered this graph, and we thought that this was a great visual illustration of some of those things that we're really trying to help individuals discover within the cover crop economics tool. We know that it's going to take a certain amount of money, it's going to take a certain amount of investment but nobody knows just how much and how high some of those costs are. We know that benefits will accrue, but we're not sure how long it takes for those benefits to accrue or how many of them that there will be at the end of the day. And so we just thought that this helped illustrate what the tool is, what we were trying to discover, but it was very important to note the source. And so this again, and down here at the bottom of the page, um, you look at this later, you can see where the information was all derived from. When we put the tool together and when we built it, we tried to be logical or what appeared to at least Lauren and I to be logical. So what's the first thing that happens when someone approaches you with a, with a new idea? Hey, if we do this, we can produce all of these great benefits and the world's going to be much better. And the first thing a lot of us will say is, wow, what's that going to cost? And so we tried to think of our tool in the same order. If we did start to incorporate cover crops, what will it cost? And then you follow that up with, okay, now that we've invoked those cover crops and started to be able to use them, what are going to be those benefits? And how will, how will they be expressed? We look at those results in the short run, and then we look at those results over the long run. We believe that the tool flows well, that it leads to this logical order, and it becomes, will be easy to use. So let's talk about costs just for a minute. And we're obviously, we're not gonna hit every one of them, but when we're, Starting with something new, such as cover crops, if we're wanting to add those to our operation, you know, it helps to think in terms of what is going to be the difference in some of those establishment and management costs. You know, again, this is something that's fairly new, trying to help people think this through a little bit. It's going to take a certain amount of those cover crops. And so what's that seeding rate going to have to be? Well, how much is that seed going to cost? We have that we know that they cost so much per pound. What if we want to have several different varieties mixed together? We have a seeding cost calculator built within the tool. So if you mix three or four different seeds together to plant them, it will calculate it all for you. We know that with 
all the, that there are many different ways that cover crops can be seeded. Um, we're not so much worried as to how you choose to seed it in this particular picture here. They show one that is a uh, high, high um, crop application as it could be flown on. They can be drilled after harvest. The key point we're trying to find out on the cost side is what does it cost to plant them? Are there going to be any extra termination costs because you have incorporated that cover crop? You know, or are you already taking care of it with a burn down or things like that? Trying to get people to think through some of these different management things that they're going to have to do. Additionally, we look at is there an extra management cost? Are we going to have to spend more time? studying? Are we going to have to spend more time making field visits to make sure that the cover crop's not too big? Did it really start to grow? Do we have some other problem? One thing that had been reported to both Lauren and I in the development of the tool was yield effects. Now, we had heard both ways that sometimes the yield effects were negative. Sometimes the yield effects of the addition of the cover crop were positive. We try to recognize that within the tool. If there's a negative effect, then that would have to be counted as a cost. If there's a positive effect, it would be a benefit and would get reported later. Also, we don't pretend to have every possible idea for all of our costs listed in the tool. We tried to be pretty comprehensive, but you know you can never hit all. We've also left a miscellaneous tab within there to where individuals can put in other costs that they feel that we may have overlooked. You know, now whether after we've decided to add the cover crops, is it going to be affordable for us? Is it going to be profitable? Well, part of that is answered when we want to talk about the different benefits. And so if we want to talk about, you know, one of the ones that we don't measure, we certainly recognize, and again, and this is a great example, that if we have a, uh, that living growing crop in the soil, we can reduce soil erosion. One of the concrete things that we can measure is if we're able to reduce that soil erosion, we may be able to be saving some money in terms of fertility because we know that in every ton of soil, there's a certain amount of nitrogen, there's so much phosphorus, there's so much potassium. Again, this base is on the academic literature and research in that area. Also, in certain parts of the country, there are annual costs for the amount of erosion repair. Some people will have to clean out ditches along the edge of a farm every year, every few years. They will have to take a scraper and they will pick up erosion at the bottom of a hill and, and redeposit the soil up upon higher on the hill where it eroded it from and things of that nature. So there are objective values that we can express for being able to reduce soil erosion. One of the fastest positive economic gains that we have seen with the utilization of cover crops has been for those individuals that have livestock. The ability to graze those cover crops and replace other feed sources to be able to offset harvesting costs and things like that, that being able to interseed cover crops into their pastures and increase their production. All these things are positive benefits and oftentimes provide very rapid. I've seen the instance where that first year being able to po generate positive economic results because of the ability of livestock to utilize, excuse me, the ability of livestock to be able to utilize that cover crop in addition to the agronomic benefits of that cover crop. Addition to grazing, we've known producers that will do some baling and whether they are trying to make it as haylage or baleage, but they are utilizing that cover crop at the end of its agronomic potential to be able to provide for livestock feed. And again, we, we count for this and try and have it within the tool to, so it's easy to use. There are other potential benefits from the utilization of cover crops. 
alluded earlier that we've had instances reported to us where the utilization of the cover crop pr provided a yield increase. We've been reported that we can reduce some herbicide use, that we don't have to make as tilt many passes across the field, so we're able to lower equipment costs and others. Again, these are going to vary by operation. They are going to vary by individual, but all of these are different variables that you can fill in within the tool when you are doing the analysis for your farm. And now before we get into actually doing a little bit of work with the tool, I wanna to just show a few things to you by way of the PowerPoint here. One is within the data entry itself. If you look at the tool where you see something, a white cell, that is where an individual can make data entries. And so if you want to be able to keep track of the particular cover crops that you're using for this analysis, you can type them in here. You can type in different costs and things like that throughout the tool. If the, if the cell is, appears white or if it appears clear, it is an area where you can make input. If a cell is darker or shaded, such as right here, that is, that is not a cell that you can change. It has a macro contained within it. You know, again, there are options in addition to the crops that are listed there. We have grazing and baling and also cover crop seed production that are listed there. And so what happens if you click one of those options, you know, for example, here is the pop-out box for baling. And so it talks about what are you expecting for yield? What are you expected for that forage value? What is it going to cost to bale it? You know, again, so that we can determine, is it profitable to try and utilize the crop this way? That this is, this is another built-in within the tool. When we get to that short run analysis, and this is a, a screenshot of a two crop rotation that was being compared. If we look at this by way of the costs and the benefits, that it, this is just the summation of what the spreadsheet is above. For cash crop one here, the cost was $27.50 an acre. There were $56.75 an acre in measured benefits on this particular crop. So the net benefit was $29.25. And then everybody's going, hey, that looks really good. Why, what are we waiting for? Well, then we look at cash crop two, because again, this is a two crop rotation. The cost was $27.50. So I'm guessing that they were using the same cover crop and using the same method of establishment. However, on crop number two, that measured benefit was only $6.50 an acre, not $56 and change per acre. So our net benefit with crop number two was $21. Now, it is still positive because again, we're going to average crop one and crop two to look at what that average annual rotation benefit is to determine that short frame analysis. When we move into discussion of long-term analysis, time frame is really important. And within the tool, as well as on here, there are two key points. One is how long of a period are you want to consider? You can go up to 50 years. The second one is that number of years to change that increase of the soil organic matter. Then this, when we're talking about soil organic matter there that we're changing, we're referring to that soil organic carbon fraction not trying to change the parent SOM itself. And so that's in there. The key point to note is that you have to have the number of years to change has to be less than the amount of the time span for the analysis or there won't be any calculation that's able to be made. Then when we get to the results of the long-term analysis that it will print this out and if you, Remember back to where I had the short run earlier, we had that $29.25 an acre benefit for crop one. And then for crop two, it was a negative 
And so here it is. This is how that's expressed on a spreadsheet basis. Now I work with spreadsheets an awful lot, but one of the things that we built into our tool, and we think it makes it much easier to read, to use, we built graphs into this. And so you can select the graph illustration. Now, I, I mentioned early in the presentation that we were a little bit conservative in our analysis. And so how long does it take for those changes to accrue? It was not clear from the literature and it's not consistent from anything that we could find that was the changes taking place on a curve, were they linear? Are they a step function? And so when we were calculating results, when we had very, when our initial release, we were strictly in a straight step function as illustrated by the red lines there, that after 10 years, between year 10 and 11 in the example that was given, when we saw that benefit, then it changed. One of the upgrades that we did based on user input and after it had been out for a little bit, we enter induced a linear line that showed what that function is, whether you pick 10 years, 20 years, we also then interpolate it and will include a linear line. What we really believe is the expected response rate is somewhere between those two lines, but without the ability to know exactly how certain benefits and how some of it accrues in the soil and how it accrues over a period of time, this was the best that we could do to be able to try and express what both ends of the spectrum are. Now, what we're looking at in terms of that financial analysis of those benefits, again, over that long-term horizon, you can see how it was positive in year one and negative in year two, and this is how those benefits accrue and in dollars over time. The key message I'd like to send you home with today is that you have to be able to assess and understand both the costs and the benefits if you're going to be able to make an informed decision as far as to add them to your operation or not. We wanna focus on what changes. Again, that is what we're focusing on with this tool. The things that aren't going to change in your operation, we're not worried about typically not changing equipment. And so that's not a major focus. We might change individual tillage classes and things of that nature. But we're trying, we're, we're dealing with partial budget analysis and not enterprise analysis. We're just trying to focus on what changes. And then lastly, costs and benefits are going to be highly variable. They're going to differ between operations. You could have two farms sitting side by side and the cover crop costs and benefits will very likely be different on both of those farms. And with all that being said, this is a, a beautiful picture of a crimson clover cover crop that uh, Lauren got a picture of when she was out doing some field visits in Missouri. And this is our departmental non-discrimination statement. And so with that, I'll exit the slideshow and try and do a, a demonstration of the cover crop tool itself. Um, Michelle, can you, can you see the... Looks great, yeah. Okay, I wanted to make sure that the, the, the presentation changed. You know, always worry about technology when you're changing. Indeed. <laughs> All righty then. Great. And so I, I have preloaded this today just to try and make it a little bit easier and in the um, interest of time. There are some defaults that we have programmed into the tool. And you can pick from some of these different defaults that we have in there. One of the things that we discovered in our beta testing is that it, users felt it was much easier to change a value than it was to come up with one. And so something as simple as the yield, the price, and things of that nature. Oh, Brian. 
we really average 50 bushel the acre on our farm. And so, okay, it's very easy to be able to make that. Don't you know that the soybeans are worth $13 a bushel today? Okay. And so if we want to make that analysis today, you know, again, those are one of those clear cells that I talked about earlier. These are the ones where you can go in, you can overwrite anything that's within there and make those changes. Again, I want to emphasize that the tool is going to react to whatever you have provided for input. Um, I talked earlier about what is the cost of cover crops on this per Oh. We have a little calculator built within the tool. Part of the stuff I have to bring in, I've got multiple screens here I'm presenting from that you, you can have any number of cover crop up to 10. You know, I shouldn't say not any, but you can list between one and 10. How much is the cost per pound? How much is the cost per acre? If we're adding different crops, it will change that calculation for us. And so you, you can add crops, cover crops that are representative of your operation. Um, again, it's relatively easy to work with. Um, so let's say that you determine that you have to spend an extra $5 an acre for extra time monitoring the crop and things of that nature. These changes that you make are automatically calculated and carried through the macros in the tools. And so this is what we, we talk about when we say you, we can go out and do what if, what if, what if, that when we get into some of the benefits that there are certain direct nutrient credits. Um, this is obviously a little bit older um, because nitrogen is closer to 90 cents a pound than it is to 40 cents a pound and things of that nature. Update these costs to where they are in your operation. Some of these other benefits, are we able to reduce some insecticide or fungicide that we've seen research that talks about the utilization of some cover crops, especially cereal rye, can help reduce mare's tail infestations and things like that. And so if you're able to do that and able to make a reduction, you may be able to reduce one pass with your cover crops, of the, then we can say, well, I got, because of the cover crop, I use 25% less herbicide. And again, we put in what our herbicide costs are, how much we're able to reduce because of the cover crop and things of that nature. Maybe the same way with fungicides. Is there a percent yield increase? Again, that we have had some anecdotal reports. This one is particularly talking about soybeans that they have seen a yield bump with using certain cover crops. Again, if that is the case, how much was that percent yield increase? This is where it's very important when we establish what was our yield up here at the, way back at the beginning. If we have a 10% increase, then we're able to determine what that value is. So that being said, again, we talked about grazing. We talked about baling. There's a seed production. If if an individual chooses to want to try and enter a market for producing cover crop seed and things of that nature. So we've tried to have a couple of these different, very common, or I shouldn't say more common options for individuals to be able to use the cover crop beyond just the crop production part. And so again, we get to that bottom analysis. And because I changed those, yield in the pricing. You notice what was had been a uh, benefit of $29 an acre in the earlier example is now 49. Again, I just did that. I wanted to be able to show you that yes, these results do carry through. And now our average annual rotation benefit has moved from $4 to $14. So again, when we move to the long-term analysis, here's the part that I was talking about earlier. If if, if, if these changes, can, you're going to do the analysis for a given number of years. The discount rate is one that we use internally on some of the macros. Um, I still feel fairly comfortable with leaving it at 3% for the time being. Um, 
I wouldn't get very concerned about changing that discount rate on some of this for right now. The current soil organic matter level and in, in this initial measurement, we're talking about what is that parent organic matter level. And this will vary anywhere I've seen from as low as 0.5 to as high as five. And so what is it on your farm? And so we talk about what some of these different costs are. Again, here is that analysis of those short-term benefits. How are they reflected? What part of it came from the herbicide? How much of it came from the yield? How much of it came from that erosion reduction that, that we have where the, those fertility values carried forward? That one of the things that the literature tells us as that soil organic matter content increases, that we can get up to an additional 20 pounds per 1% increase. And again, we provide just a quick link there to the soil fertility information and what that is all based on, that where we have these little pop-up boxes, you can get more information about the tool in and of itself. We do have a value for a water storage benefit um, this is the closest one to an externality, but there's it's pretty heavily researched as such in the the literature that be, if we're able to be use those cover crops and increase what our water storage capacity is, that it does have a value. Oftentimes, I will tell people make sure you run do some of your data runs with this as a zero value. So again, checking the sensitivity and seeing how much that affects the value of your cover crops. That in, in the uh, Midwest where the, a lot of this is used and we're not using irrigation a lot, that it becomes more of a variable to talk about than it does for applications compared to some of the instances where we've seen the tool used under irrigation. And again, when you get down to the analysis, and we showed this screenshot a little bit earlier, if you want to be able to go to see the graphs, like I saw, showed you earlier, you just click on the graphs bar and it will bring you to what all those graphs are. You can choose to print them, print them out. It also provides you an analysis. If you want to go back to the tool, you just simply tell it you want to return to the model. Do you want to save this particular run? You can do that. Do you want to change the default to scenarios? You can do that. Oh, if I want to go back to the short term. I forgot to make this one change. We can return to the short term analysis that the price of corn shouldn't have, or my yield wasn't really 160. It was really only 150. Again, so how does that make a change? We've tried to make the tool as user friendly as we possibly can. The greatest hang up that we've had repeated to us, and because on my computer it's already a, a trusted file, so it doesn't ask me. But oftentimes, after you've downloaded and initially opened the tool, you'll see this yellow bar up here, and it will ask you a question Do you want to enable content? Tell it yes. And then it will oftentimes ask Do you want to enable macros? Please tell it yes, because if the macros aren't working, you will get some really, really weird results. And so, Michelle, I think that kind of concludes the demonstration I've got. Um, do you have any questions or how would you like to proceed from here? Fantastic. Took me a while to find the mute button. That was fantastic. Thank you so much. We have a few uh, requests for the tool um, in the chat and uh, several people voted it up and Aisha was able to share a link. So um, perhaps everyone was able to, you know, pop in and follow along where you were uh, going. Um, let's see, are there questions? Um, no open questions. Um, uh, come on, folks, don't, don't be shy. Surely you've got a <laughs> Oh, good. Here, I uh, I instigated Craig Smith. 
agronomist, um, our costs of phosphorus and potassium fertilizer intended to be as uh, P2O5 and K2O, um, I'm not gonna pretend uh, to say those correctly, since those are commonly used in the US. And do you see that yourself? Um, are you able to read it yourself, uh, Brian? No, I can't, I can't, no, I can't read it, but that, Again, what we're trying to get that down to is, is equated back to that on a per dollar basis. And so that the night, you know, if you're, you're, if you're buying the nitrogen, you know, it, it, we're still trying to get back to pounds per acre. And so even though if it's P205 and I can't remember all the calculations top of my head, but yes, that is a calculation that you will have to make to be able to enter that phosphorus or that potassium value. Very good. And uh, the Google tells me that it's phosphorus pentoxide. There we go. So it helps you along then, the tool? The, no, it won't break that out because, you know, if it's, no, that's why I said you will have to do the conversion because when you're trying to put on, we might talk about we're going to go out and spread 100 pounds of 0450, you know, so, but how, we know that we're trying to put so many pounds of phosphorus on. You will have to do the calculation as to how many tons of the actual phosphorus that you're putting on and address that in that value. The tool does not do that for you because there are different, different parts of the country have different fertilizer mixes that are available to them. And so that's why we, refer to them just strictly as the P and K values, trying to mm -hmm. stay consistent with um, other agronomic reference. Very good. Um, Joe Scarf, um, uh, if I've pronounced that correctly, writes, do you envision that this tool might be used to evaluate ecosystem benefits for a solar farm for cover crops or maybe even pollinators? Have, have never tried it, have never beta tested it in such an environment and without a crop to measure it against, I'm not sure. I'm not gonna say it can't, I would have to sit there and work through the variables, but to, to date, as far as land use change or something like that, no, I have not tried to use this tool in that fashion. <laughs> Great, and Joe Scharf uh, uh, helps us uh, realize that how to pronounce his last name, it's Scharf. Very good, Joe, thank you. And you know, just to point out, Joe, Joe asked about evaluating ecosystem benefits and you clarified that you, you know, rightly or wrongly had to steer clear from additional environmental externalities, um, you know, which a lot of people try to put a value on, but you, your tool decided not to go there. Correct, and again, part of that was that we were trying to focus on those at the end of the day, we're trying to measure those direct dollar effects. And so the, the, the great thing about externalities, you know, that there are a number of benefits to them and we certainly recognize them. I haven't met anybody yet that is a fan of dirty air and dirty water. But <laughs> by, the same, by the same token, when I'm sitting down with my banker at the end of the year and I say, well, I got this $37 an acre environmental benefit. And he says, great, I'd like to apply that to your operating loan. Where's the $37 that it becomes more difficult because of the difficulty in valuing, the difficulty of measuring, and then the difficulty of extracting that value as a direct benefit. Indeed, great. And um, Craig Smith, agronomist, wrote again, just to clarify. So by P and K, your model follows the scientific standard of the element per acre and not how the ag industry expresses these two nutrients as phosphorus pentoxide and potassium oxide. Yes. Indeed, yes. Beatriz Moreno Garcia says, can the tool be used for any crop? that we, we have not had, at least in our beta testing, again, we had vegetable crops, we had different row crops, we've had cereal crops that we, no, no limitations for us here in the United States were reported. Again, once we get off the continental United States, our, 
the change again the the key point is going to be if you add cover crops to that given crop what changes exactly exactly great um any more questions from the audience don't be shy this is what we're here for oh manuel garcia writes is the version 3.1 the most updated it is great thank you Ooh, so many more uh, Madeline Mason, yes. If this is the if this webinar was recorded, where can we find the recording? Um, I believe it's in the first um, um, hyperlink that Kinsey Rice shared at 12:05 p.m. Eastern in the webinar chat. Um, so please use that to find the recording, which will be placed there in three to four days. We try to you know get it there at least by the following Monday, if not you know this Friday. Um, and let's see, one reply, I had one in reply. So Kazi Ula, hopefully I'm not butchering your name. I downloaded from this link. It's not the same detail what I see in this presentation. Then it showed some macro issues to perform the tool. Um, I guess, uh, can you check the link that we provided um, in the chat, Brian, to make sure we shared the right link? Are you able to open the chat and see? I'm, I'm, I'm trying. Sure. <laughs> and for time sake too, Brian, if you guys want to share us the, like, the most updated link and we can send that out on an, that email with the recording as well, just to make sure everybody has it. Okay. That would be great. Thank you, Kenzie. I'm going to pause on the last question while you um, attempt to share the correct link, Brian, in the chat. That it, it's got an active act, or at least how it's trying to download right now. And so I don't know if this is an edge problem or what, but it is. Open, come on. Okay, now when I click on download that file and then open it up from that from that link, and again, that security warning that I talked about pops up at the top where you have to enable content, then I pick a uh, default because I'd said I had preloaded it, it's being slow but i think it's all there but i will yeah it right now part of it is just being really slow at least on my end but after from the link that you provided michelle once you once they click on it they need to tell it to download okay and that's what i think that just clicking on the link, it won't run from their screen that they'll have to download it. Or at least that's what that's what I did because that they actually linked it from the uh, state of Iowa's cover crop economics page, which is they just changed our computer system not too long ago and all of our web links. And so Iowa was able to get this back up with our, our tool. And so that is the right version but you will have to download it. You won't just be able to run it from the web. Okay, that sounds good. Uh, Joe Scharf uh, writes again, did soil types play a role in the spreadsheet such as loam, sandy, clay, et cetera? Only from the perspective of those become variables that, that you change. You know, what is that organic matter? We know we're gonna have lower organic matter in sands versus clays and loams and things of that nature. You will typically have different production values and costs because of that, but we don't have a soil type per se that you select to run the tool or anything like that. 
Right, right. So it's, again, it's not ge geographically specific in that sense. Um, Correct. To the extent that you as a producer or you as an ag advisor or a conservation professional recognize how the soils and the weather, you know, affect your costs of production, um, that's how right. it would be indirectly um, Right. And it, it would also be recognized in that amount of time to change because the, the higher organic matter soils typically change slower you know that the for example the the soils in the far southern united states because of some of those old weathered clays that might be down to a half a percentage point of organic matter they can see a lot of change within five years and the researchers tell me that they can lose it all just as fast and so that's how that's how some of those differences are accounted for in the tool yep great and um um, our friend, uh, was it Carl, um, I think um, provided the same uh, link that Aisha has previously provided in the chat um, to the tool. So it is thank you to Iowa for getting the websites back up and running and providing that latest and current version of the NRCS cover crops tool. Cool. Well, don't be shy. There's still plenty more time. We don't want to cut anyone and their questions short. Michelle, I did have one direct message me. Um, the question is, how is the number of years to increase soil organic matter by 1% figured? And again, part of that is that is a user provided number. And again, what we're looking at, that increase is the soil organic carbon content. And part of that, again, goes back to the question earlier on what is the so type of soil um, that may, I don't remember that there being a, a pop-up box. I do know that we discussed that, that's listed there in the literature and citations tab. Um, that becomes a key part of the long-term analysis is that time frame. You know, like I said, based on the research that we'd seen again for example at auburn what they can do in five years there on those old southern weathered soils might take 10 to 15 at columbia missouri and perhaps 20 to 25 at mandan north dakota so much is different based on where you're at where you're where's the geographic reference where is the soil, excuse me, not where is, what is the parent soil type and things of that nature. Some of that is, is very localized and we don't pretend to know how fast it changes and everywhere. That's why we leave that range for the individuals to be able to use. Again, if you're looking at something, well, I can change it really fast. I can change it in five years. When you're doing those what ifs, see what happens if it really takes you 10 or what happens if it really takes you 15 and see how those results change. Sounds good. Um, well, feel free to interrupt us with a late breaking question. Otherwise, we'll just wrap up with this final um, one minute of the uh, final slide. Aisha. Yep. Well, thank you everyone for participating in today's webinar. Um, here are some steps in our collective outcomes quantification journey. Uh, first, we look forward to you joining us at some, uh, at some or all of the next set of tools training webinars that will be held on the first Wednesday of every month, except for January, uh, which will be held on the second Wednesday due to the neighboring holiday. If you can't make it to one or more of the webinars, but want to view the session, the recording should be available by the following Monday. Uh, second, at the end of the webinar, please share your feedback with us by answering a quick six question survey. Kinsey shared the link at the beginning of the session and it will also appear as a new tab in your internet browser when the webinar ends. Please take a couple minutes to share your feedback so we can keep improving these events. Michelle and I are also offering free coaching sessions uh, to now six farm project managers who secure a session with us. These sessions are individually tailored to you in order to help you figure out which tools or methods are right for your project. If you're interested, uh, just email me, Aisha Tap Ross, and in the subject line, write coaching request. 
And finally, um, if you'd like a free print copy of the guide to be mailed to you, you can place that order online at the report's website, which you can easily find by using the keywords AFT Outcomes Tools. Great. Well, thank you so much to Brian Kerwin for this fabulous uh, slide deck you've put together for us and this awesome walkthrough of this awesome NRCS cover crop economics tool. We appreciate you, Brian. Thank you. And thanks to everyone for Bye. joining us today. All right.